And now without further ado, what I'm going to do is um, share some slides with you. I've got 20 or so slides, take about 20 minutes. Um, to set the scene, talk about the book, um, not exhaustively, you'll have to read the book, um, but to set the frame and I guess to establish the questions that the book explores and how it does that, how it answers the questions. So let me share my screen with you. So there's the cover. Um, it's very tempting when we have an image to interpret it. And we could have lots of fun talking about why there's an owl there, for example, and what the flowers in her hand represent, for example. But that's not at all what we do in the book, as you shall see. Um, all, I, all I'd like to say about the cover is that it's beautiful, and I'm very grateful to Keith Robinson, the illustrator who drew and painted it. Um, I think just gazing into that image, notice the impact, the impression it's having upon you. I mean, in a way, I was thinking about this, maybe I don't need to say anything. I get, maybe if you looked at that image for long enough, you'd work out all the things in the book. Um, second thing I wanted to say about the cover is the character is Daphne, and she is a character that we meet in the course of the book. She is my uh, case study client, not a real client, but based on real clients, a composite of real life um, experiences over the years. And we follow her in a transcript that threads through the book as, as she has a, a waking dream. Um, so, you know, it's a non-fiction book, but there is a story. Any good book on imagination worth its salt needs to have images and stories. Um, next slide. Uh, it would be nice to be able to just maximize the slides. Here we go, good. Now, it is a book on imagination with a difference. Um, most books on imagination, and I've read a few, not all of them, but most of them do one or both of two things. Um, they offer theories to explain what images mean interpretations um, in different ways and um, archetypal interpretations of Greek myths um, inner child language, the internalization of childhood history, etc etc etc. The other thing that books on imagination often do is they give you techniques, they give you tools, image-based tools you know, like visualizations or meditations or guided imagery journeys through particular landscapes that are said to affect particular outcomes. Now, there's a place for both of those things, but my book, Waking Dreams, avoids both. Um, waking dreams isn't so much about what images mean or how to use them because I figure images aren't a machine to be used and imagination isn't a machine as we shall see and interpretations is really thinking about images which is fine um, but what my book's about is about imagining per se so it's about how to live a more imaginative life in and of itself. It's um, about how imagining the process of being imaginative is healing and transformative in itself. And it sketches out an image centric approach to not just psychotherapy, the context, the background, I mean, certainly my influences come from psychotherapy, but I've done 
quite a lot of work to um, present that in a non-jargon fashion and also to give examples that go beyond the consulting room into everyday life work and play so it's it's it should be certainly of interest to psychotherapists but not just for psychotherapists and there's a quote from the introduction um I mean, it's probably no mistake. I've written the book that I would have liked to have received on starting my therapy training. Um, because at that time, back in 2002, 2003, um, life was a bit dull, a bit flat. I guess I was a bit depressed. Um, and I saw in part, I mean, I had lots of ideas about why I was struggling. Um, but one of them was the loss of my imaginative life or, or the, the sort of paucity or the impoverishment of my imaginative life. Um, I felt life was just becoming a bit more dull, a bit more flat. In the book, I used the metaphor of it felt like life was like this, this screen on my mobile phone. It was just like scrolling through and just passing over me and no, no longer really impinging on me in the way that you might want it to do when you're struck by a sunset or a beautiful scene and you stop and pause and you take in the whole surroundings and you really feel there. Yeah, I guess I was just a bit in my head and a bit alienated from where I was and my sense of belonging. So I thought a therapy training would be a good place to get some advice on the recovery of my imaginative life. Long story short, it didn't help. I mean, we were doing lots of things, drawings, psychodrama, making masks, talking about our dreams, um, which was probably why it took me quite some time to realize while we were using imagination, while we were thinking about images, I wasn't actually becoming more imaginative. So there's two main reasons that I explore in the book as to why that was the case. The first reason is that images in conventional therapy by and large are of secondary importance. Conventional therapy isn't really interested in images per se. In a sense, they're not real. And, and, and in fact, they're, they're somewhat suspicious uh, or to be suspect or taken as suspect. What we're really interested in a lot of the time in psychotherapy is figuring out what these images represent. So the image content of a lot of these image-based techniques would be taken as a symbol and then translated into the feelings or the thoughts or the behaviors or the real world events that it represented. Now, you might not have gone to therapy, you might not have had that experience, but you've probably gone to an art gallery. And the analogy is, well, not the analogy, the, the same thing happens in art galleries. You can look at a painting and you can uh, spend some time with that image and allow it to impinge upon you and move you and take you somewhere into the life of the artist and his imagination. But often what happens if you're anything like me, you're a bit impatient and you maybe spend 30 seconds doing that. And then you look at the blurb and you go to the blurb to find out what the image means. Okay. And you find out a little bit of history about the painter. You learn about his technique, his influences, his subjects, etc. And you think, Hmm, and then you move on to the next painting. It's not really moved you, the blurb. It's not really why I go to art galleries. And yet I get drawn and drawn again to the blurb. So there, what you have there is a difference between an imaginative experience, which you could have if you looked at the painting, and how that's different to thinking about the image, analyzing the image, explaining the image. And often these two things get muddled up and when that happens, usually the thinking eclipses the imagining. So that the book is really about, let's just 
push back this thinking thing and give some space for imagining. And what does that look like? The reason being that interpretations, while they're perhaps interesting, rarely in themselves lead to lasting change. In the same way that the blurb about the painting doesn't really move us, doesn't really transport us, explanations about our dream life, explanations about our fantasies, our anxieties about the future, etc., etc., don't really change us. So the bit goes into what does change us, and that is experience, joining up all the different aspects of your personality through imagining. The second of the two reasons why conventional therapy doesn't really enhance your imagination is the framework of an inner imagination. This is kind of base assumption in a lot of therapy books and in the dictionary. So the imagination is assume, assumed to be an interiority, a psychological interiority, a personal subjective realm separate from the objective world, which is full of facts and science and truth and imaginary something a bit dodgy and inside you. Um, now, for me, what I was looking for was an imagination that took me back into the world. So straight away, an inner imagination withdraws imagining from the surrounding world of people, places and things. Um, but if you think about it, immersive imaginative experience, whether that's reading a novel, enjoying a movie, um, or indeed walking through a landscape, it is one of being in a place. It is one of being surrounded by images, um, whether they're fictional characters or trees in a forest um, or a sunset in the skyline. These images are not inside us, they surround us. And rather than images, rather than an inner imagination, it's we that walk through and surrounded by imagining. So the book turns that idea inside out. And it's a distancing language. It's a somewhat abstract language. It's kind of like peering through the bars of a cage and an image trapped in the zoo, like a, a genie trapped in a bottle. So what the book does is ask these questions and explores these questions in different ways. And what I've been looking for and what I've presented is um, answers to these questions. I'm looking for a theory that's more aligned to the actual experience of imagining. Because the, the rather shocking conclusion is that a lot of the theories that we use in conventional therapy don't actually align to what imagining is when you get into the phenomena. So what is imagination? What are images? And what is going on when we imagine are really important questions, not just theoretically, but also practically, um, because ideas matter. And um, if we've got limited ideas, that means we have a limited experience. So I'm looking for expansive, nuanced, complex ideas that help us enhance validate imaginative life. Essentially, where we get to is that we're imagining all the time. And it's a nice little quote that I use in the book from Philip Pullman, the, the author. He says, you won't understand anything about imagination until you realize that it's not about making things up. It's about perception. So we're imagining all the time. So like, as you watch this Zoom call, Really, the screen's just a flat, static, inert object, pixels, and some sounds from the loudspeaker. It's your imagination that takes that raw data and turns it into a place, this three-dimensional place that I'm sitting in. Um, movement, time is passing by, and uh, not an inert objects or a robot, hopefully you perceive me as a, a living being, a person, and it's imagination that is doing that, not just with screens, but as we walk around in the world. So here's the chapter structure of the book that fell into place um, last autumn, after about a year and a half of writing the book. 
on the way back from uh, Morrison's supermarket. Um, so there's a theoretical chapter, chapter one, embodied imagination. And then we have an experiential chapter, Waking Dreams number one, entering, that grounds and it gives examples and exercises that rolls out the ideas from the preceding theoretical chapter. Then we have another theoretical chapter, immersive imagination, and then another theoretical chapter. So there's these interleaving or interwoven chapters that give you some ideas and a discussion and then a practice and principles. So it's a practical guidebook, but more than that, it's also a, a theoretical and critical discussion. And as you saw there from the chapter structure, Waking Dreams, the title of the book, is the practice that I use to frame the experiential element in the book. So what is a waking dream? Probably a lot of you, if not all of you, have experienced a waking dream at least once. When you're, usually in the morning it happens to me sometimes, so I'm waking up and I feel like I'm still in a dreamscape and at the same time a simultaneous awareness of lying in bed happens. So I'm in a dreamscape and I'm in my bedroom. Usually that doesn't last for very long, but waking dream practice, also known as active imagination and guided imagery, stretches out those moments. And that allows us to explore what is a really rich vein of spontaneously creative and therapeutic imagination. So I thought we'd do it in a way. Um, so as you, as you look at the, 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 the bedroom picture here, um, bring to mind your own bedroom. Bring to mind a memory of your bedroom. And remember what it looks like and the state that you left it in this morning and how large it is, the kind of bed you have, the view out the window. So very briefly, what we can say is that as you're here in the physical world, as it were with me in the Zoom call, so that's like the lying in bed element, that overlaps with an imaginal world, the memory of your bedroom, a waking dream. You've not even closed your eyes. Um, so whenever an imaginal reality overlaps with a physical reality, a memory in this case, but equally it could be a future fantasy. Um, we have, broadly speaking, a waking dream. Now, the, the, the book um, builds on but develops waking dream practice. And there are two, um, yeah, two developments in the book that go beyond um, a standard presentation of waking dream practice. So let me just briefly mention them. So the first one is um, waking dreams as an imaginal process. So um, often waking dreams or similar image-based approaches um, are used in the same way as sleeping dreams, simply as a means to generate image content that we then go away and reflect upon afterwards. We think about what that what those images mean. But it's, it's always struck me that the obvious advantage of a waking dream is that consciousness continues into the dreamscape. And that allows us to study the process of not just what we imagine in retrospect, but how we imagine in the moment. So I use waking dream practice as a means to find out what actually happens in the moment of imagining. So here's a some of the things that we get into in the book. So to imagine is an embodied process. It's a synthesis of all the senses. So images are not just visual uh, or optical uh, pictures. Um, they're also auditory, they're, they're uh, gustatory, they're um, 
other words for um, sounds, auditory sounds. So you've got smells, sensations, touch, uh, taste. It's all there because an image is actually a place. This might seem obvious, but it's neglected. Images are when you imagine you find yourself in a place. When you enter into a dream, obviously that's a place, but when you enter into a movie, you imagine yourself in the landscape of the movie, as it were, for example. Uh, to imagine is a synthesis of all the psychological functions. So we have sensing, but also feeling, thinking, actions. However, we want to and need to avoid analytical thinking about. So if, we're, we're, if we want to imagine and be imaginative, we need to suspend, bracket, avoid abstract interpretations. So we can have a thought like, who's in my bed? I wonder who's in my bed. That's a thought within the process of imagining. But we'd want to avoid a thought like, um, who does this person in my bed represent? which would take us outside of the process of imagining. Another principle is that to imagine is to personify. Images like to communicate with us and um, they're animate. And there's lots of sections in the book on the therapist role. So quite practical tips, strategies, things to do, things to avoid that the therapist would want to do to facilitate imaginal process with clients, which if you're not a therapist, will still apply to you in your life in trying to be more imaginative. Second development is that for me, the point of waking dreams isn't just to get good at closing your eyes and um, studying images in the mind. The point is for me is to carry over the imaginal sensibility that you might develop in that way, in that traditional active imagination sense but to let it spill over into the activity of images in everyday life as what we explore in the book, as, an, as I call an eyes wide open waking dream. Because the imaginal and physical um, realities in a waking dream are happening all the time. So people, your friends, your family, your colleagues, your clients, they're, they present a physical reality and also we have a story about them and an imaginal overlap that we tell about them and indeed ourselves as characters in the world. Places, uh, obviously there's a physical um, place, but then we have stories about that. Our sense of belonging um, it, uh, is a waking dream and things. Um, so between you and the Zoom call, there's a waking dream happening right now, uh, or a movie, or like listening to a song on the radio. Um, but we also talk about trees. There's a little section on tree hugging that I'm quite happy about. Lampposts. So people, places, and things are imagined. There's no getting away from the imaginal nature of everyday life. So the image-centric approach that I lay out in the book doesn't seek to eradicate imagining, doesn't seek to replace uh, a faulty or a fantasy imagining with objective reason. What it does is it seeks to enhance the quality of how self and world come together in imagination, because that's what imagination does. Is it, images exist in liminal space between us and the world. And if we attend to that in-between interaction, We can heal ourselves, we can change, we can be creative. Now, there's a distinction in the book between fantasy and imagination proper, if you like. Fantasy is a repetitive, limited and overly subjective imagining that's quite disconnected from the objective world. So that's when we get stuck in seeing people uh, in behaving in repetitive fashions. There's a sort of imprint about who we are in the world that continues regardless of changes in circumstances. And that can cause quite a lot of pain, neurosis for ourself and others. Um, 
but it's not a black and white issue. We can't get rid of the subjective element of imagining, but what we can do is seek to enhance how self and world come together and make our imagining less repetitive, less habitual, make it more fresh, flexible, creative, and one that aligns uh, and participates more sweetly with the people, places, and things of the surrounding world. And what we find is that imagination isn't just a representation of the world, like a camera capturing what's there. Imagination creates possibilities. Um, and the more that we imagine, the fuller and richer our lives become. And there's various applications for the waking dream approach that I set out. Most obviously are, are image-based therapies. Will um, find an alignment with where I'm coming from, but also generic therapy because the raw material of any therapy session, what is it? It's images, or you can see them as images. Memories are images. Future fantasies about what's going to happen next week, they're images. And also how we see the therapist, what we call the transference, is an imaginal process that the book explores. Ecotherapy is a big inspiration in the book, um, but they don't often talk about images or image work. So essentially the book is an image centric approach to ecotherapy. So it's a, about place and belonging. Eco means home. Um, the arts, uh, so writing, writing or painting or any, any kind of creative artistic activity, will recognize and gain from developing the waking dream principles in the book. Or you don't need to write a novel, you can enjoy novels more if you clarify and develop your imaginative life. And indeed any kind of creative inquiry in organizations or research projects will find something in the book. So there we are, um, back to Daphne again. <clears throat> 